All right, welcome back to another episode of Doc's House Calls. Today we have on with us a startup microbrand owner, Zach Rakovan, from the new now starting microbrand Arter and Forge. Uh, Zach has the distinction of being uh, one of the alumni of our original inaugural microbrand university workshop this past April. So now here we are in November, seven months down the road, and Zach is now launching his brand with his first model, the Roth Rock. And uh, it looks fantastic. So I wanted to have Zach on. So Zach, welcome and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So obviously, you know, it's November and you just started growing a beard. So you know, that seems to be working out well for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, overnight. <laughs> I, I like to see guys doing November and really embracing it. Um, <laughs> all right, so I know a little bit about your backstory, but I, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, since you are just starting, they don't. So why don't you take us back to, uh, maybe go back before you attended the Microbrand University. How did you end up thinking about making a watch, starting this brand, and you know, tell us about some of the, uh, the challenges you've had leading up to where you are right now. And then, we'll, and then we'll kind of finish that with, where are you right now in terms of, is the watch available and all that? Yeah, sure. So, um... I guess the, the startup story goes back pretty far. Um, I've always been into watches. I mean, I can remember being in second, third grade. You know, I'd, I'd save up my allowance money to buy a watch. It'd be a watch on my Christmas list, um, that kind of thing. And, and whenever I graduated, I knew that I, I wanted to design watches, to design outdoor gear. I mean, that's, that's what I went to school for. Uh, I went to Auburn University. Um, graduated there with a degree in industrial design and that's really where I was hoping that my career would lead me um, on graduation I had an internship offer from Fossil actually but it was unpaid and I had student loans come and due, so that wasn't really a, a possibility for me um, and so I took a job with uh, Concept Center International where I worked with a design group there for uh, Rigid and Ryobi power tools um, and hopped around to a bunch of different design jobs. Uh, it was a terrible time to be looking for jobs. I mean, the economy was, was you know, really bad then. So about when, when every 10 or 11 years. About 10 years ago? Sorry? This, this is about, what, 10 years ago? I graduated, yeah, I, graduated in, I graduated in 06, so this was like 07, 08 that I started, right. you know, looking for full-time stuff after the internship. Um, worked for Hunter the Hunter Fan Company, uh, their lighting division, Kenroy Lighting, was there for about 10 months, got laid off, uh, picked up a job in Charlotte, North Carolina with a playground manufacturer. That was a really cool job. Um, you know, we designed the playground equipment, we had a prototype shop where we would actually build the concepts out, you know, then invite like a second or third grade class in to, to test everything out. You know, just I thought you were going to tell me all the guys in the they office, never like, used you know, take their shoes off and go running around in the, in the playground equipment. Yeah, no, I mean, they never used anything the way that we had in, designed and intended it to be used. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I think I was there for eight or nine months before I got laid off, just kind of chasing jobs up and down the East Coast, getting laid off a, about every 10 or 11 months. Um, Is that typical that for designers in that, in that industry? No, I mean, maybe during that decade, but no. Right. I mean, it just, it just happened to be a, a bad time in the economy and unfortunately R&D departments were usually the first ones that got the axe and especially me being a new hire I, you know I, I really didn't stand much of a chance so well, I mean yeah like you said yeah definitely I mean, a challenging you know, the big recession started in 2008 so the next decade was and it, it wasn't just design I mean I know I have friends who are lawyers and they say there's been like a lost generation where guys couldn't find a, a, a job as a lawyer and they just left the business. They're, they're, they got law degrees, but they're not lawyers anymore. And it's like a lot of, I think, guys went through that. I mean, I know in my career, even though I graduated 10 years before you, I got out of the Army in 2000. And things were going great right up until 2007, 2008. And it was just like a seven-year sideways slide for me. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people in that position. There, there's a lot of people that I graduated with that have a have a design degree that they've never used. I mean, it was really hard to get a job and it was even harder to keep a job. Um, well, maybe in that way, you so were lucky that you just got as many kept different, 
that you had as many different opportunities as you did. Maybe it was lucky for you that you got that experience. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's, that's kind of what I go to, to put a positive spin on it, to look back. I had so many different experiences and so many different industries um, over the course of those 10 years. I mean, I got to work with a lot of big time brands, you know, marketing departments, uh, design departments, obviously engineering departments. Um, like I said, the, the Ridge and Ryobi tools, there was the Hunter and Kenroy lighting. I worked at a couple different sign shops, uh, Rite Aid, GNC, Party City. Um, I was on, back, on those accounts. I kind of got to see behind the scenes. Go back a second. So you were saying that yeah. you got to work with like, you know, marketing departments and, you know, you, you rattled off a bunch of other departments. So this is something that I saw uh, a bit in my sales career where, you know, product design came first and then they kind of flipped it over to marketing and then marketing did their thing and then they handed it off to sales and we were supposed to sell it. And a lot of times I got frustrated and I'm like, who built this product? Why didn't they talk to sales first? We could have told them what our customers wanted to or who made this marketing collateral why didn't they talk to us this is not really what we need this doesn't effectively you know help us sell so you yeah. know from your perspective was that you know kind of refreshing or surprising that to be in product development and have that interface with marketing and other departments uh yeah it was when it worked that way um, but but to your point certainly not every uh business that i was with operated that way i mean there there were some that were definitely um, engineering based, I would say, like how cheaply can we make this? How quickly can we make this design it that way? Um, there were some that were kind of from the sales perspective, what's our customer need? Let's design that, you know, uh, not necessarily as, uh, as innovative maybe as, as some of the other ones. And then I well, think there were some places. I'm, I'm asking you this because I think it's something that we talk about in Michael Brand University, which is yeah. You know, understanding what the customer wants instead of just making what we want to make, make what the customer wants to buy. So, yep. you know, did that, did that past experience influence what you're doing now with your, with your watch business? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That was kind of the point that I was leading up to. Definitely having all of those different perspectives from all of the different brands and the different people in the different departments that I worked with and, and the different industries that I worked in. Um, some of them were very collaborative and those seemed to be the ones that were easier, uh, you know, a happier place to work and ultimately were delivering a better, a better product in the end. So let's jump forward a little bit to you're about to start your brand, your watch brand, Arter and Forge. Were you still working full time and yeah. it was a, like now is the time for some reason? And if so, why was that? Or did you lose a job like I did? And you said, well, that's it. I'm going to, now I'm going to make my watch because I've got the time available. Yeah, no. So I actually had tried to start a couple different things throughout the layoffs and being unemployed. It just never really went anywhere. Um, I really just never lost my drive to, to be designing the, the watches and the outdoor gear like I had set out to coming out of high school. So now I, I had a full-time job. I started working on Order and Forge in January of 17. Um, had a full-time job at Penn State. I still have a full-time job at Penn State. Um, and, you know, I, I settled down where I'm from, um, near, near State College, near, near Penn State main campus is where I grew up. And um, I have a wife now, three kids, a house, and just kind of, I'm, there's nothing in this area for industrial design at all. There's certainly nothing in this area to be a, to be a watch or an outdoor gear uh, designer. You know, you, you got to go to some, at least closer to some city to do that. Right. And um, my wife and I just aren't, aren't interested in that. You know, this, this is home. This is where our roots sure. are. This is where we're going to stay. When so you, when you say coming to outdoor, that realization was kind of the. When you say outdoor gear, what do you mean by that? You know, for those of us that are not outdoorsy, I'm what they call indoorsy. So what does that mean? Besides watches, what does outdoor gear mean? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, again, going out of high school, Going into college, I would have been happy getting a job with like Coleman, you know, maybe designing, uh, yeah, somebody like a Coleman, you know, designing camp stoves or, you know, backpacks, pocket knives, just, just any type of that, I, I guess, everyday carry gear, hiking, right. camping, anything in that, in that realm. Do you have like a favorite brand in that realm of outdoor gear? I mean, is it Coleman? 
Uh, I mean, they do a lot of stuff, obviously, on the lower end that's, that's you know, easily easily attainable, you know, at Walmart. But I don't know. I wouldn't say that, that I have a, have a favorite. I, I don't know that stuff. I know, like, John Keel from Watch Gauge, he's got a guy that works in his office, and he's got one of those, like, high-end coolers that, like, all the rage now, like a $300 cooler. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, like a Yeti. A Yeti. A Yeti. He's got a Yeti cooler. And I'm, yeah. I'm like, $300 yeah. for the cooler? I mean, does it keep the beer even colder? And once it's cold, it's cold. I don't understand three hundred dollars for a cooler. Just give me an igloo. Yeah, right. No, I mean, yet Yeti wasn't around when I was coming out of school, obviously. But yeah, they, they'd be an awesome brand to work for. Yeah, they're right. they're doing some really neat stuff. So obviously, you've got you know this sort of outdoorsy you know ness to you personally, and that kind of comes through in your brand. I can see you're wearing the flannel. I, I, this always cracks me up. I was talking about you and your brand on the watch forums. And one of the guys said, are, is this watches for lumberjacks? And I was like, yes, yes, it is. They are, they are watches for lumberjacks, but obviously not everybody's a lumberjack, but there's a lot of guys that are into the outdoorsy stuff. They, they own Yeti coolers or, you know, they, they do, they have a reason to own an outdoor camping stove or whatever. Again, I don't, but some guys do. They like that thing. So, um, you know, tell me about the Roth Rock. I was, I was just on your website before you jumped on watching the video. I didn't even realize it was named after what, a national park or something? State, uh, state forest, yeah. State forest. Yeah, it's, yeah. Is that so Roth, Roth Rock State, of, go ahead. Yeah, um, Roth Rock State Forest here in central PA covers about 100,000 acres of Pennsylvania. Just an awesome place for anything that you want to do outside, I mean camping, hiking, biking, they have horse trails, they got boating, you can hunt there. I mean, and essentially I, anything you want to do, you can go there. And do. I take it this is close to you, you spent a lot of time there? Yeah, yep. I mean, that's, I mean, that's so where I used to go. Go ahead. I've seen, I've seen your pictures on Instagram where it's you and your kids hiking in the woods. Is that Roth Rock State Forest? Oh, yeah, a lot of them are. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have, I actually didn't know this until I, until I got into Marauder and Forge and started uh, doing a little bit more research and stuff, but anybody that's in Pennsylvania is within 25 miles of a state park or state forest, which I thought was was pretty. Everybody in the state is within 25 miles of a state forest or state park. Yeah, no matter where they are. No matter where you are in the state of Pennsylvania, that that was one of the uh, you know the initiatives of of the forestry department or whatever it was back in like the the 70s, I think. Yeah, they, I've lived they there almost my whole life. I've lived, I've lived in Pennsylvania almost my whole life. I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting little tidbit. Is that, I mean, is that unusual among the 50 states? I take it it is. I think so. I think so, yeah. So nowhere, you, you can't go anywhere in the state and not be within 25 miles of a state park. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the way I understood it whenever I was reading it. I'll take yeah, it. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. So let's do some bare bones basic stuff. I'm looking at your website. I see the watches. There's prices. Are they available right now? Can somebody just go on and buy one right now? November 19th, we're going to launch pre-orders. Yep. Gear, I'm gearing up for the, for the pre-order campaign. All right. So that today's what? The 7th, I think? 8th? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so. so like 11 or 12 days from now. Now. Yep. And by the time people see this on YouTube, it'll be like a week maybe. Or, or it'll actually, it'll probably be by the time this airs, your watches will be for sale. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, probably be like two weeks when we put this up. So yeah. there's the four designs and, and tell me about, okay, so it's the Roth Rock, but it's the Roth Rock Detweiler or Juniata or Seeger or Thickhead. Is that, what is Thickhead? Is that a fish? No. So, so as a collection, as a whole, it was inspired by Roth Rock State Forest. And within that, each of the variations the colorways were inspired by a different part of the forest. Okay. So we have uh, the Juniata was inspired by the Little Juniata Natural Area, the Detweiler inspired by Detweiler Run Natural Area, uh, the Seeger, which was after Allen Seeger Natural Area, and the Thickhead, which was after Thickhead Mountain Wild Area. All right. So and, these areas, what yeah. what do they have to do with these particular designs? Is it something about the colors, or is there something something else that? How do you tie how do, if I, if, how, like, how do I connect the, the, the part of the park to the different models? Yeah, so, um, like I said, each of those different wild or natural areas 
was the inspiration for that particular variation. So like with the, the Juniata, uh, the Little Juniata natural area was known for, um, there was white quartzite that was mined there till like the 50s or 60s. And if you hike through the area, there's just all of this white, it's, it's a whole mountainside of white quartzite. And if you watch the video on my website, you can actually see clips of the inspirations right before we introduced the watches. Mm -hmm. So like with the Juniata, you'll see that it, it looks like natural glitter. I mean, it's just this glittery rock. It's, it's really interesting and really cool. Obviously has caught my eye being in that area. So, so the, that white quartzite kind of inspired the, the white full loom dial of the Juniata. Um, then keeping kind of with that same theme, uh, Detweiler Run natural area is like, a, it's an old growth area. Lots of big trees, lots of downed trees, lots of moss, mud. Um, so that kind of inspired the earth tones of the Detweiler. Yep. Uh, the Seeger, the Seeger from Allen Seeger natural area, there's uh, Standing Stone Creek that runs pretty much all the way through it. So that, that blue of the water was kind of the inspiration for the, for the blue dial of the Seeger. And then Thickhead Mountain, um, wild area, just a, again, old growth area, lots of big trees is a great place to hike and camp. So the idea for that one was kind of, you know, you're, you're out on the mountain at night around a campfire, you know, telling stories, just kind of that, that nostalgic feeling. So that's where the, the, the black and the orange came from, um, you know, just kind of that, that feeling. All right. So I want to talk more about the watches because there's some things that you're doing that are pretty different. Um, first question is all the images I see, they're no date only. Do you have a date, no date option or are they all just strictly no date? Yeah, for now they're, they're no date. Um, we're using the NH35, so we do have the option of offering a date um, in the future. But just to start out with, I, I didn't want to have that many SKUs to, to worry about. Um, so right. we're just going no date. Okay, fair enough. I mean, some guys, you know how it is. I mean, some guys just, they need the date. And some guys, you put a date window on there, they just won't buy it. So, you know, I, I get what you're doing. Sometimes you, you know, when you're starting out especially, having a lot of SKUs maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so and I, and I put it out there, I got a lot of feedback and, and it seemed to be about, I'd say 70-30 um, in, in favor of no date. So, I mean, that it was it was an educated decision. You know, it wasn't something that I just said, eh, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna put a date on. That was kind of the feedback that I got. When we started, I asked you about, to tell us some of the challenges you've had leading up to where you are now. And I, I still want you to tell us, but I think that'll come out naturally as we start talking about the watches. Cause I know some of the, the stuff in that yeah, as far as sure. challenges go. I didn't notice this until just now. You actually put that wood texture on the rotor of the movement. Yeah. So how yeah, is that done? Is that like printed on the rotor? Or is there like an applique, like a sticker on it kind of? That's an actual oak veneer um, that is applied to the existing uh, metal rotor. And what is that like your, that, is that burned in that word rock rock? Yeah, wow. that's burned that's, into the old veneer. I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen a rotor with a wood veneer cover on the, the rotor plate. I haven't either. <laughs> All right, so I, I remember you telling me your first set of prototypes you have made, you have this, um, what technically would be called a rehote, but I guess some people would call it like a chapter ring, but basically it's the vertical surface or slope surface between the dial and the crystal, you want that to have a real wood texture. And the first set of prototypes, it was like, it almost looked like anodized aluminum with like some streaks in it, it didn't look right. And I also know that you had, um, you really worked hard on this. You've got this sort of, just to kind of take a step back, most watch cases are either cold forged or CNC machined, but either way, the exterior surface will have either a brushed or a polished, sometimes blasted surface. There is no such thing as sand casting a watch case, but you wanted the case to look like it was sand cast, and you had to figure out how to get that sand cast texture on the exterior surface of the case. And yeah. again, you had to basically invent a process. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the overall inspiration for the collection, Rothrock is very rocky uh just and i mean ton, tons of rocks on the trails everywhere so that's really where the sand cast the inspiration for the sand cast texture came from and um again i'm i'm familiar with a lot of manufacturing processes throughout my career and and the sand casting typically does leave 
a texture that looks a little bit like sand. I think it's really cool, and, and it's nothing that I've seen on a watch case, obviously, before. And I no, thought that it would be not really like interesting. You know, because blasted is like kind of satiny smooth. It's not like right. that. It really has almost like a grainy kind of a texture to it. Not rough, yeah. just kind of like, you know, it's more tactile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, we spent a we spent about a month figuring out how to do that. A lot of trial and error and determination, um, and we basically developed a multi-step process with uh, with lasers, rock tumblers, uh, a couple different things. It's it's about a four or five step process to get that that look. But super pleased with the way that it came out. I mean, exactly yeah. what I kind of imagined it would be in my mind. When you told me what you were trying to do. It, like it almost hurt my head. I was like, how is he going to get this done? And then I saw your most recent batch of prototypes at district time last month. And I was like, it looks like it's been sandcast. It's really amazing. And, and again, it's like not everybody will warm up to it, especially I think if you're too used to brushed or polished, but it's really a cool effect that you got, you, you figured out how to pull off. Yeah. Thank you. So do you want to talk a little bit about, the struggles you had getting here? Cause I know like, you, you know, we've talked about this. You've been through at least two rounds of prototyping. You've gone through at least two vendors. I know you work, you've got a guy in, you know, overseas that helps you, you know, as a partner, like helps you source different things. So get back to, you're starting this watch project. You're still working full time. You're in the middle of nowhere. There's no outdoor companies based there. So you kind of have to make this work on your own. And then, you know, trouble starts. So tell us about that. Yeah, it was a long, painful process for sure. Um, you know, at first I was just on the forums, on the Facebook groups, reaching out to other brand owners. Hey, where do you get your stuff manufactured? How did you, how did you get started? Can you put me in touch with, with your OEM? Can you put me in touch with your factory? And I, I mean, expectedly, most people were pretty tight lipped. Uh, right. um, wasn't a whole lot of information out there. Uh, I dug around Alibaba, obviously, because that was kind of, you know, what a lot of people said that they did. I, I did. I it's, that's such a landmine, and I didn't really feel comfortable with, with moving forward with any of that. Um, so, yeah, eventually I found an OEM, you know, to, to work with and felt pretty comfortable about the, the relationship. They made a lot of promises that they ended up not delivering on. Um, you know, to your point, you said you mentioned before you saw my first pro actually my second prototypes um and and the wood elements right so they told me that it was impossible to mill wood to that tolerance which i want transparency if you don't want to do it tell me you don't want to do it don't right. tell me that it's impossible because i know that it, i have enough experience to know that it's not impossible it's difficult but difficult is not the same thing as impossible well, so what, it might be, you know, somewhere in the middle, it might be impossible for their vendors. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. sure. So what they ended up doing was basically um, digitally printing a piece of steel to look like wood. Uh, and I saw it. It didn't look like wood. It didn't look like wood. No, it, it looked like a low quality digital print of uh, tiger stripes, honestly. Well, I mean, first uh, off, it was orange. It was orange right. and it had like, like you said, like sort of like black tiger stripes. I mean, that, that's what the closest thing it looked like. It looked like, like, a, like somebody made a tiger striped interior surface on your case and that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. And I mean, if that had been the only thing that was wrong with the prototypes, I probably would have figured something else out. But I mean, it was, it was one of maybe 20 or 25 things that they didn't make the spec. They didn't color match the stuff right, even though I had given them PMS codes. It was, it was a bad experience. Uh, I lost about 18 months of time and my entire prototyping budget. Obviously, we had gone through two rounds of prototypes. You know, they weren't going to give me that money back just because I wasn't happy with it. Right. Um, so, well, and this is something, awesome. you know, you and I have talked about this, but it's something I talk about with other micro brand owners, which is, for better or worse, sometimes you get what you get. And it's, that's just the industry right now. We don't have, we don't deal in contracts. Everything is on a handshake. And sometimes, you know, you're expecting, you know, one thing and, and you get a completely different, you know, they just don't meet expectations. And sometimes they're doing their best. And sometimes it's just, we're not really sure what they're doing or why. And it's just, 
maybe it's, a, it's easier for them to do it the way they're doing it and just tell us they're going to do it a different way. We don't know. So, you know, right. for a lot of guys, I think, in your position would have just kind of pressed on and said, okay, well, I'll, I'll figure out how to sell this that they gave me as opposed to going, no, this isn't what I want. I'm going to go back to the beginning and redo it all because I want what I want. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it was. I mean, I went back to not necessarily step one, you know, I had learned some things through the process, obviously that I carried on, uh, but completely reset and basically just spent four to six months um, building my own supply chain. You know, you had mentioned that I have a guy, Taylor, uh, who, who's working with me. Um, he lives in China. He was formerly the supply chain specialist for William Sonoma. So he knows what he's doing. Um, he knows the language. He knows the terrain. Uh, he knows how to, how to make relationships. He has some relationships. Um, That's a good, so like that. good to Yeah, it was a game changer for me, for sure. Um, through some other networking, I had a short list of factories that I really wanted to talk to, didn't necessarily know exactly how. Um, and then through his network, he, he added a couple other factories to the short list and he was able to go actually physically meet with these guys, uh, you know, take a tour of the facilities, send me video, you know, have, have a, a WeChat kind of conversation with, with the owners, you know, basically whatever I asked for, he was able to go in and, and get the answers to, um, it and he was the language. language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that helps a lot. Yeah. So he was able to oversee, you know, the, the production of the prototypes and just make sure that everything's being built to spec. Anything that was that needed troubleshoot, shoot it. You know, we, we, we took care of it. And uh, like I said, yeah, complete game changer. The third prototypes that, that you've seen, I mean, are, are I would say, 99% of, of what I envisioned that they would be the first time that I sketched them up. A couple well, small things we're going to change in. I would, I would say their production quality. I mean, that, that's yeah. really where a lot of, you know, anxiety comes into play when you're doing prototyping is so often you get something, it's like, it's not really the way I wanted it. It's not really as good as it should be. Do I proceed and go to production and, and just, you know, make those changes on the fly or I make them make again and again, like how much time am I going to lose doing another round? Yeah. And prototyping could take three or four months. Right. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not a quick or a or a cheap process to make another round of prototypes for sure. But so the the price on your website says three fifty to five fifty. I'm looking at like the rock rock thick head. What yeah? What, what was between three fifty and five fifty? Is there options here or final final retail will be five fifty. Pre orders pre order price will start at three fifty, and um, so we have a limited we have a limited quantity in each price tier. So yeah. as they sell out the price will bump up by 25 bucks got it that makes sense okay so retail price full price in stock 550 right. pre-orders start on november 19th they start at 350 which is you know a nice discount so when do they then get delivered uh we're shooting for beginning of may okay for delivery. so now obviously we have chinese new year in there that you know puts like a three to four week delay in your production cycle so if you start on right. november 19th Typically, I, I say plan for four months minimum, in this case, five. So you got December, January, March, April, May, five months. Is that what we're yep. saying? Okay. Yep. So I would, you know, just to be conservative, I might say people like late May, early June, but certainly five months is not an outrageous, you know, wait. And, you know, you're offering a nice discount for those people that get on board early. And you're giving them yep. real photographs of real prototypes. So that puts a lot of people's minds at ease. And, you know, hopefully they appreciate the work that you've put into this point because it's been a lot and there, you really do have some real clear differentiators. Nobody else is doing this sand cast case texture. Nobody else is, is, you know, doing the, you know, the stuff with the wood in the watch that you're doing. I mean, that, yeah. that, that reho inside is that's real wood, right? Yeah. There is, oh, it's real Oak in the reho uh, oak on the rotor plate, like we talked about. And then on the actual tip of the crown, there's a, there's a little slice of oak in there as well. Oh, that was another one that, that they, the, the first or second round of prototypes weren't really correct. It was like, I mean, again, it was supposed to look like wood, but it just looked like a piece of metal yeah. that was tiger striped for some reason. Yeah, it was, it was digitally printed and however they laser cut it and laid it in there. Some of them were crooked. Some of them looked like they were going to fall out. It was, yeah, it was, it was bad, but they're, uh, I'm really, really happy with, with everything on, uh, on this round of prototypes. Yeah. I mean, they, they really do look good when I saw them. So your case has like a, um, 
the top surface almost looks like a rotating bezel, but it's not. It's just fixed, right? Yeah, it's just a fixed bezel. Okay, yeah. but it looks like a rotating bezel. So people need to know it's not a rotating bezel. But 42 millimeter case, 10 millimeter, or I'm sorry, 10 ATM water resistance, Seiko NH35 movement, screw down crown. What does offset crown mean? Is that at the four? It's just not. Yeah, right. Okay, so yeah. screw down four crown, Swiss Super Luminova, drill lugs. So you've got two sets of lug holes, but only one is drilled all the way through. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we we put a, a double uh, double holes in the lugs just so. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially with a field watch, guys want to put it on a leather NATO, possibly, you know, a thicker strap. And a lot of times you run into issues where those, the, especially with short lugs, there's just not enough space, just not enough tolerance between the case and your spring bar to get those straps in there. So and we wanted to make sure, you know, whatever kind of aftermarket strap you want to put on this, you'll be able to. I mean, I can tell by looking at it, the lugs are short, but tell us what's the lug to lug length on this? 50. 50. All right, so it's a 50 millimeter lug to lug, 42 millimeter case diameter. If you can pull off a 42, 50 millimeter lug to lug is kind of like, it's about average. Maybe a little bit on the short side. They, they look shorter than that, but I guess maybe that's just the proportions. Um, yeah. But, you know, original case design, um, you know, nothing really too homage about it. I mean, I mean I, it's, it's not really like anything else that we've seen before. And just a real crisp, solid field watch design yeah thank you yeah well i hope you do really well with it so do you want to talk about other ideas you have for the future I and mean, you don't have to give anything away but if you want to give us any you know like where, where's your head at for future models yeah i mean the uh the idea bank is always full i mean i'm sure that you know also um i definitely yeah, think that there's following the first model like I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do for the second. There was just so many things, like so much excitement, like, okay, what next? Right. Now it's kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm sort of almost out of ideas now. So, so, all right, so back to you. I didn't, I kind of took over there. What, what, what do you got coming up or what do you think you'll, you'll work on next? Um, there's definitely some other, I would say like destination inspirations that I, that I would like to do. Uh, there's a couple other state parks in PA that are more well-known, I think, than, than Rothrock that would be cool and, and I'd be able to stay close to home. Um, I'd love to maybe do something in a national park like the Smoky Mountains or you know Yellowstone, something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily all, always have to be destination. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity with, I'm definitely gonna anchor everything in nature, uh, but I think there's so many opportunities there. I mean, it could be something that's inspired by some, Part of wildlife, you know, a bird or a different animal. It could be just something about the, you know, the the journey that you're on to get to the whatever destination you're going to. Um, yeah. So yeah, I have I have a lot of ideas, but you know, I'm kind of still focused on on getting this uh, campaign launched, and then I'll have to really sit down and, and try to think what uh what direction we're going to take it for the second one. When you say campaign, are you going to put this up on Kickstarter, or is it just going to be on your website? Yeah, no, just on the website, just the pre-order campaign. Okay. Have, have you had good interest? You got, you know, a good email list built, people following you on Instagram saying, yeah, I'm definitely going to be in for one? Yeah, uh, I mean, I got the prototypes finished up, obviously, a little bit later in the game than I had hoped. Um, I got them the day before we did uh, District Time, which was just here, what, the second week of October. Um, so that was the first opportunity that I had to really start getting in front of people. But uh, I had one guy that heckled me there in DC, but other than that, uh, it was heckled just, you? Yeah. <laughs> what? yeah. Tell me about that. What I, happened? He, he said, well, I see you're touting this. Everybody keeps talking about this check chair. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's very good. I was like, all right, well, I mean, I'm sorry. He said, well, what happens if I gouge it? He said, then you're going to see stainless underneath. I said, I mean, you'd have to, You'd have to knock it pretty hard, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's possible that you gouge it. What am I going to do with it then? I can't take it anywhere. Nobody's going to be able to fix that. You're going to take it back. You're going to fix it. I was like, right, maybe well, this isn't for you. <laughs> well, let's slow down. I said, it's, it's, it's possible that you gouge the watch. All right, so you, right, so you got four models. One of them is DLC coded, the 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 yeah. thick head. Right. If you forget the texture, if you put DLC on a watch case and you gouge it. Yeah, 
you're going to see stainless steel underneath. The texture's got nothing to do with that. One of these, the Detweiler, it looks bronze, but it's not. It's, it's also like a PVD plating, right? Yeah, it's a vintage gold PVD plating. Okay. And then the other two are just like, they just look stainless, right? Yeah, it's just raw stainless. There's no other finishing on those at all, which, okay. so this which a lot of people... With your finish is if you damage the finish, I'll see the raw metal underneath. But that's true of any finish, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, that, I, tried to, I tried to explain that, but it, it didn't seem to be sinking. Well, I mean, all right. So, yeah, if, I'm, if, the, if the metal is brushed, you can, like, hit it with a Scotch-Brite pad. If it's polished, you can hit it with a Cape Cod cloth. You can't really do that with a blasted finish. You probably can't, you know, repair the finish with yours. But you really got to bang that thing hard that's, to get that's, some yeah, that's, to your surface. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's kind of what I had explained. But I mean, outside of the field watch. <laughs> outside of that one guy, the, 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 uh, the feedback has been really great. You know, I had a lot of people stop on their tracks and, you know, kind of validate to me, wow, you know, I've never seen anything quite like that texture. Obviously, the, the wood plate on the rotor as well was, you know, a, a big talking point. Um, but I have it out to a couple guys on, on YouTube, um, a couple other bloggers and reviewers, but it's, it's been definitely getting some good uh, good feedback. Has anybody posted? And I've been kind of doing the already? media starting here close to him as well. I see you got Random Rob up here. Has he, has he posted his review already? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Random Rob was the, was the first uh, YouTuber that I got it out to. Okay, and I see Time Bomb did a review. So these are good. All right. So field watches and more field watches. Do you think like a diver, a pilot, a chronograph, are you going to go down that road? Or is it going to be like, nope, just field watches all inspired by nature? You know, that, that's the brand and, and we're sticking with it. I could see possibly doing, doing some other options, but um... I, th I think field watch is definitely going to be the, the core focus. You know, maybe, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what that ratio is. Maybe it's, you know, four field watches for every one other one that we do or something like well, that. Well, I mean, I just think, I mean, look, you've got a 42 with a Seiko. You could do a 40, you could do a 44, you could do a 38. Exactly. You could do a Miyota, right. you could do a Swiss. I mean, there's so many yeah. different things you could do because I don't care how many people like it. Not everybody's going to like it at 42. So I mean, some guy's going to say, I'd buy it if it was 44 and another guy's going to go, you're crazy. I'd buy it if it was 40 or 38. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Date, no date. Yeah. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of options. I don't think I'm, yeah. I mean, you, you've got plenty of runway here before you run out and you got to yeah. you know, figure out something else. Yeah. All right. Well, what, is there any particular time that pre-orders open on November 19th? Is it like midnight or noon? Uh, I haven't set a time exactly, but for anyone that's on my email list, I am going to email them that exact time, probably the day before, just so, so they all have a heads up. All right. So this is Tuesday, the 19th, sometime on that day. But if they want to have the most up-to-date notice about the time, they got to sign up for your email list, which is on your website. Yep. All right. And the website is... Ardor and Forge. That's A R D O R A N D F O R G E dot com. Ardor and Forge dot com. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ardor and Forge, same thing at, at uh, Instagram and Facebook. Well, I, I saw something on your, there was something I wanted to look at on your Instagram. And then just as I was about to click on it, you jumped on here. Um, scroll down. What is this thing? It looks like you're holding like a wrestling belt. Happy Valley Hustle, Hustle Champ. What, what, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, that's a local podcast uh, Bill Zimmerman does. It's called Happy Valley Hustles. And uh, it's a podcast where he interviews kind of, you know, like you and I are talking right now, he interviews a lot of, you know, small business owners and entrepreneurs um, around the Happy Valley State College, Pennsylvania area. Um, so, yeah, anybody that's interested, definitely check out. There's there's always a lot of, a lot of good insights to glean if you're uh, – thinking about starting your own thing, whether it's watches or, or something else. All right. So for people that aren't from Pennsylvania, you're in State College, which is where Penn State University is. Happy Valley is the nickname for State College. It's a very Penn State thing. It's a very Pennsylvania thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, yeah, the Happy Valley Hustle is definitely a local thing. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm a Penn Stater too, but I was never that into it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't go to the main campus. It was like satellite campus. Um, all right. So before we wrap this up, anything else you want to tell us? People should, you know, you want people to know about it or the brand or you or. No, I think we covered everything. Okay. All right. So one more time, people want to go to ardorandforge.com, sign up for the email newsletter. That's how you find out exactly what time on Tuesday, the 19th pre-orders are going to start. At the very least, I recommend people go and check you out at your website and on Instagram. I've seen these in person now. The sandcast texture on the case is very cool, very unique. Um, and, you know, there's a lot that this watch has going for it. And it's not yet, it's not, oh my God, it's yet another 300 meter diver, Rolex Submariner homage, you know, whatever. It's not another minimalist on a NATO strap. I mean, this thing is very cool and very much its own thing. And I think you've done a great job, you know, kind of establishing an ethos for your brand. Thank you. All yeah, right. a, lot, a lot of time and energy into it. I'm glad that uh, you're getting good feedback. So, you know, we have maybe one more minute or two minute, more minutes before we wrap this up. Um, so, like, I just want you to, like, give us a plug for Microbrand University. You know, now that it's been, you did that seven months ago. How do you feel now, seven months later? Do you feel like it was, you know, do you still feel like it was worth the, the, the investment and the time spent in there? And, you know, has it come back to you in other ways? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, I, and I've told anybody that's asked, you know, a couple people came up and asked uh, whenever we were in DC. Um, I spent close to two years, if, if not a full two years, um, figuring out how to start a business. Um, I took webinars, I, I went through a 10 week boot camp here at State College uh, that, was, that was for startups. Um, just anything that I could take online, anyone that I could talk to. Um, it was a little bit difficult to take all of that information, digest it, and then figure out how to translate it into how do I use this to start a watch company specifically. Right. Tons of great information, but always a little bit hard to translate. And especially when you don't have someone who you can sit with and have a real conversation with, okay, I get this concept, but can you help me apply it? Um, you know, I was kind of on my own for all of that. I feel like Microbrand University essentially took everything that I had spent two years trying to learn. And I mean, that's, that's what you taught in two days. Uh, I mean, I would have saved myself so much time if that had been an option two years prior to that. Um, right. So yeah, absolutely valuable. Um, the biggest the biggest part for me where, where I took the most value from Microbrand University, honestly, though, was since those classes. It was for, for me because I had spent so much time learning all of those things on my own. It was really more of a refresher course in, in that aspect. Uh, but all of the, the guidance that you and the other coaches have been able to provide since then has just been tremendously helpful. You know, anytime that I've run into an obstacle, whether it be with trying to figure out fulfillment or, you know, just, just discussing, you know, the, the tariffs that are going on uh, with China and the U S different aspects that are going to come up uh, just through running a business to be able to have you guys to bounce those things off of. And you just kind of have discussions has been uh, tremendously helpful. Do you have so like yeah, every, every, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you, do you, what do you think was like your biggest takeaway? Zach, can you hear me? Um, oh, you're thinking. Yeah, I was thinking. I think I think my biggest takeaway was that you know you and obviously you brought some experiences from other brand owners that you have known and, and have talked to even you know on Doc's house calls. Everyone seems to have also gone through a lot of the same struggles that I was experiencing. It was it was yeah. comforting, I guess, to know okay, you're not the only one that's dealt with this, and then also here's how I've dealt with it. Here how's, here's how some other guys have dealt with it. You know, these are kind of the options, but it's not perfect. And, you know, it's just kind of something that you're, that you're going to have to deal with. Uh, Cause I'm, I, I'm definitely a, a perfectionist. 
And I kind of, and I kind of had to take a step back and say, okay, maybe everything isn't going to fall in line exactly how I want it to. And certainly not the first time around. Um, right. But, but just, to, just to be able to have that, uh, that, that feedback that, you know, I wasn't the only one going through those obstacles. Yeah. I mean, that was something that, you know, I, I talk about this a lot where, you know, when I started my business very soon after Sue Jane from Melbourne and Chip from AVIG were starting theirs and we formed this instant sort of three-way bond between us and we were all kind of in it together, not just going through the same experiences, right. but really sort of like emotionally invested in each other's businesses and success because we were right there. Like I'm having the same problem at the same time. These other two guys are having the same problem and we're working on this together. Um, and there was that sense of camaraderie, but you know, the, one of the biggest impetus, you know, behind um, Michael Brand University was my knowledge that I know there are other guys going through this. I'm talking to these same, you know, other brand owners on Facebook or, you know, they're coming to me for, yeah. you know, for advice or asking questions. And I'm like, we, I've, I've gone through this four times. Sue Jane's gone through it five times. Chip's gone through it six times. We've all been through it. We got the answer. We should just like try to sort of accelerate that learning process, you know, flatten that learning curve for everybody. So that was the point there. But yeah, I mean, sometimes I guess it's just hard to accept that it's not just you, it's all of us. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I love what you guys are doing with that. And I mean, I, I think it is the whole kind of, you know, um, what, what is it with the, with the, the saying with the tides, the, the rising tide <laughs> lifts all ships or whatever it is. I mean, I, but I, I think, I think it is, you know, the, the more that, uh, microbrands and the more that the microbrand owners can get together, I think on the same page, I think that we're, we're able to make each other better through those types of conversations. And I think that that's kind of the platform that you guys really built microbrand university around. And, and I think that there's still a tremendous value to be taken from a guy that, that has been in business and has had his brand around for several years, just to, the same way that there is for somebody that who's first starting out and maybe hasn't even, even launched a project like, like the position that I was in. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're never too old to learn. I mean, you know, I didn't know some of the stuff that, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you how to do a sand cast texture on a case. If you asked me, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So you had to go and figure that out. And, if I ever want to figure out something like that, not that exactly, but you might be a guy I turn to and say, Zach, you know, you know more about this stuff than I do, or you have a guy over there, I'm trying to figure this out, can you help me out? So it's nice to have that kind of network of people that are in the same, you know, not necessarily direct competitors, but in the same business and saying, hey, you know, can we help each other out here and, and not, you know, worry about oh, this guy's going to steal my idea or this guy's going to use this against my, you know, turn around and use it against me. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't. Th I don't think that that everyone should be looking at each other as as competition. I think we can all help lift each other up. Yeah. All right. So this has been great. Hopefully, people you know find out more about you and your brand through this video, and they get on board the pre-orders when they start November nineteenth, Tuesday. Sign up for the email newsletter at the ardorandforge.com website. That's when you'll find out the exact time on Tuesday because there is a limited number of slots at those very low prices and then you know price starts going up as people kind of buy through those so if you want to get on board super okay. early all right zach thanks for joining us good luck with everything